I, I know what it's time to do in the worship. But if God has been good to you, don't play with me now. If, if, if God has opened the door, if God has answered a prayer, if God has dried a tear, why don't you look at somebody and tell them God's been good to me? Now listen, if you're in a dead spot, if you're around some folk who look like they didn't come to praise God, you have my permission right now to find you a section, find you some people who look like God's been good to them. Thank you, Jesus.
if, if I didn't know any better, I would think you all came to have church this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Luke at chapter 10. Luke at chapter number 10. Commencing in verse 25 through verse 37. <laughs> All right. I'm trying not to holler right here. <laughs> Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk this morning about the empathy deficit. The empathy deficit. Leading up to the 2008 presidential election, the then candidate Senator Barack Obama lamented the lack of empathy in the United States. Senator Obama exclaimed, there is a lot of talk in this country about the federal deficit. But I think we should talk more about our empathy deficit. An empathy deficit, an empathy de deficit is our ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Senator Obama said, we live in a country that discourages empathy. A culture that too often tells us that our principal goal in life is to be rich, thin, young, famous, safe, and entertained. The church is inevitably influenced for better or for worse 
by the cultural milieu of the day. Ours is a society that has normalized political hostility, racial tension, domestic violence, and social slander, exacerbated by an overexposure to media information and violence, the emotional distance of social media, and self-absorption concerning being popular and successful. In 1964, at 3 a.m. in the morning, a woman by the name of Kitty Genovese was stabbed to death while returning to her apartment in Queens, New York. As many as 38 witnesses saw and heard the attack as it occurred over a 30 minute span of time. And not one of them stepped in to help the victim. Social psychologists has labeled this and other disturbing events of the same kind as bystander apathy. In 1973, students training for ministry at Princeton Theological Seminary were the subjects of an experimental study on empathy. These are seminary students who were in this experimental test, half of them were read the parable that I just read to you in Luke chapter 10. And they were told after having heard the parable to leave that building, go to another building and do a mini sermon on the parable that they just heard read. The other half of the students in the control group were not told anything about Luke chapter 10 but to go into the same building and make a speech on a totally different subject. There was a man staged in the study who was in the middle of the road with bandages and uh, fake blood to make it look like he had been attacked. And the students who had been read the parable of the certain Samaritan on their way into the building to preach a mini sermon, step over the man that they were going into the building to preach about. We don't have to go to 1964. We don't have to go to 1973. People today are so unempathetic that we see people in trouble, we see people in distress, we know people who are struggling, and we are so self-absorbed, so self-centered, that all we care about is me, my, and mine. You don't have to take my word for that. Look at what we have in our hand, in our purse, in our coat pocket. An I phone. Face book. You too. Preceded by my space. We have been habituated to think and to feel mostly about ourselves. Because all of us are familiar with a selfie. You love yourself so much that you take 10, 15 pictures of yourself until you get the one that you think looks most like the movie star you want to be. We turn it, we crop it, we filter it, we feather it, we smooth it over, and now we have a phone where we can get people out of the picture if they're not cute enough. Somebody ought to help me preach here this morning. We can't even go to a restaurant to eat 
without taking a picture of the food. Just eat. Next time I see that, I'm just going to just grab a piece of meat off somebody's plate. Because we can't, we can't control ourselves. Some of y'all looking at your phone right now. Trying to make me think you're taking notes. No, you ain't taking no notes. But this morning, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, I want through this message this morning to retrain, restore, and reboot us to our original default position of empathetic design imprinted on each of our souls because we are made in the image and the likeness of God. And contrary to the devaluation, deconstruction, and dismissal of absolute truth, we are our brother's keeper. Earlier in chapter 10, Jesus characterized his disciples as little children to whom God had revealed great truths. And he contrasted them with the wise and understanding from whom God had hidden these great truths. The parable of the certain Samaritan dramatizes the contrast of a wise lawyer and two wise intelligent men who pass by on the other side and they are contrasted with a lowly Samaritan who stops to render aid and if that man who had fallen among thieves who was a Jew had known it was a Samaritan who was helping him he wouldn't even have allowed him to put his hands on him. Brothers and sisters the majesty of parables is that they give us a glimpse of the transcendent through the lens of the ordinary. Something incongruous happens in the story that, that jolts the expectations of the listeners and points to something about God that is transforming. The main idea of this pericope from verses 25 through 37 in Luke chapter 10, the main idea is loving God means that you cannot place limits on love for other people. If you love God, you can't decide who your neighbor is. If you love God, there are no people that you cannot love and people you love because you know them. You've got to love everybody because if you love and you say you are of God and hate your brother, the Bible says you are a liar and the truth is not in you. How can you love God whom you have never seen and hate your brother who you see every day. Matthew chapter 22 and Mark chapter 12 parallel this Lucan text. But the story of the certain Samaritan is found only in the gospel of Luke. In the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, there are 613 laws given to man. 248 of them are positive and 365 of them are considered negative in nature. These laws formed the basis for Jewish belief and practice, particularly the religiously elite Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees. However, Jesus takes all of these 613 laws and sums them up in two great statements of divine truth. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. This young lawyer, this, this man skilled and trained 
in the Torah. Stands up to tempt and test Jesus. He, he wants to ask Jesus a question, not because he wants information, but he wants to test Jesus to get an advantage. And so the pedagogical method of asking questions and receiving a response was, was common in that day. And asking questions and receiving a response was what this lawyer did all day long. And he had, had been in competition, I'm sure, with other lawyers of his stripe uh, competing about how much they knew. And so he hears that there's a new rabbi in town and he wants to test Jesus' knowledge. And so he comes to Jesus. Listen to that. He comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus. And he says to Jesus rather sarcastically, teacher, master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the question is wrong. Not because he wants to tempt Jesus, which is really what he wants to do. But there's a word in the question. There's a verb in the question that makes it wrong from the beginning. Because he asked, what must I do? That's the wrong question. Because there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life because an inheritance is in the hand of the person who owns it and if you receive an inheritance it's because of the generosity of the person who owns it somebody ought to help me talk it if your parents your mother your father die and leave you an inheritance you didn't work for that. You didn't earn that. That does not belong to you only by their generosity. God does not owe us eternal life because what can you do that will impress God? See how quiet you got right there? You think going to church impresses God? You think singing in the choir impresses God? You think reading the Bible and teaching Sunday school impresses God? You think being a nice person impresses God? No, God is impressed by an humble spirit. God is impressed by people who put their hands down and put their head down and say, God, I need your mercy. I need your grace. I've failed miserably. I've fallen so many times. I'm embarrassed to even come in your presence. How dare you sit in this church this morning and not worship God? Who do you think you are? I said, who do you think you are to sit in this church with your head up in the air like we're supposed to be worshiping you? We didn't come here to see you. We don't care nothing about where you went to school or how much money you have in the bank or what kind of car you drive. The star attraction here is Jesus Christ. He is the subject and the verb of the Christian religion. He's the center and the circumference. He's the first and the last. Living and was dead. Behold, he's alive forevermore. He's the only one who deserves glory. He's the only one who deserves honor. He's the only one who deserves praise. So next time you come to church, leave your ego in the car. Leave your degree on the shelf. Leave your self-importance at home. Because the only one worthy I said, the only one worthy of all the praise is God alone. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And Jesus, with a, with a rather sharp tone when you read it, Jesus is rather sharp in his tone. He's rather cutting and biting in his response because Jesus reads this lawyer's heart and he knows that he's trying to trip him up as if that's at all possible. Uh, Jesus is probably saying to himself, now I wrote the law. I am the law. And you're trying to test me on the law? Jesus said, all right, I'm going I'm to I'm play this game with you. Um, you're a lawyer. You've read the Torah from cover to cover. You know it better than I do. So what do you read in the law? So the lawyer has to come with the answer. He says, uh, the Shema says, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Any orthodox Jew would know that. That's the, that's the character of empathy. The character of empathy has to do with brothers and sisters talking to us. Love God with all your heart. We are to love God with all our heart. All your heart means to love God without pretense. To love God genuinely. Not because of what he does, but because of who he is. Um, a little child asked his mother for a peanut butter sandwich. And his mother went in the kitchen, made a peanut butter sandwich, put some jelly on it, and brought a cold glass of milk, set it down in front of the child. And the child with the biggest grin on his face said, Mama, thank you, I just wanted peanut butter. But you gave me peanut butter and jelly and some milk? Mama, thank you. This morning when you prayed, when I prayed, we just asked God for some peanut butter. But God added some jelly, a glass of milk, a nice table to sit down and eat it. Somebody ought to help me preach here. You just asked God for grace, he gave you a new car. You asked God for mercy, he gave you a promotion on your job. You ask God to be good to you, you got a brand new house. That's some stuff God gave you that you didn't even ask for, nor did you deserve. Because what I deserve is hell. What I deserve is eternal damnation. But God gave me a brand new life. The choir just sang it. God gave me a new determination. I wish I had a witness in here this morning that you have some stuff right now that you know you don't deserve. God's just been good to you. God has just showered some blessings on you. You asked for one thing, he gave you 12. Yeah. All your heart, all your soul means not only should you love God without pretense, but all your soul means you need to love God emotionally. Emotionally. Make a joyful noise. Church ought to be noisy. Raucous, hollering. You ought to leave church tired. All you can do is go to the restaurant and eat your meal and go home and go to bed. Go take a nap because you are tired from worshiping God because it's enthusiastic. It's movement, it's excitement, it's emotional, it's clapping, it's getting out of your comfort zone. I see you. 
some of y'all in here this morning talking about it don't take all that especially when you got two or three nickels in your pocket and you got, you, you got one or two degrees. You don't just say it, you, you shake your head when you say it. It don't, it don't take all of that. Negro, please. If anybody ought to give God some praise, if anybody ought to clap their hands in the sanctuary, if anybody ought to open their mouths and give God praise, it's black folk because God brought us through the middle passage. God brought us through the brutality of American slavery. God brought us through reconstruction and Jim Crow. Every back door, Every textbook handed down second hand, every police authority, every act of legislation said to us, you do not matter. But our slave owners made a mistake. They let us go to church. And then they compounded the mistake when they let us meet Jesus. And since I met Jesus, have I got a witness here? I'm not going to let you determine how I give God praise. You don't know what God has done for me. Somebody talking about it don't take all of that? Speak for yourself. It don't take all of that for you. But you don't know what God has done for me. Let the redeemed of the Lord Say so. Some of you, some of you who were raised in the rural like I was raised, raised in a little country church where they didn't have stained glass and cushion on the pew. They had some paint on the window and an old preacher didn't have any learning. And, and, and the deacons would pray the same prayer every Sunday, glasses all crooked on their eyes. And we would go home, those of you who were raised in churches like that, we would go home and pray their prayers after them, playing church. Somebody ought to help me preach right here. I would hear them in our old church saying, Lord, here I am. Once more and again. Knee bent and body bowed. Thank you for a reasonable portion of my health and strength. I used to play praying that prayer, but now that I'm over 60, Lord, here I am. Once more and again, knee bent and body bowed. Thank you for a reasonable portion of my I wish I had a witness here somebody here who's climbing up in years you got you, you got to be able to tell these young people it hadn't always been like it is right now God has opened some doors for us God has made a way for us I'm, I'm, I'm trying to leave that point but yesterday, last night, did you see my Astros? If they had lost, I would be with Seattle. Because I'm going with the winner. But the Astros last night played 18 innings of baseball. And when that, that rookie hit that that home run, I could hear people screaming in my house and they were in Sugar Land. And all of that hollering and screaming was over a ball team. Al 
Altuve didn't wake me up this morning. Have I got a witness here? Alvarez didn't put food on my table. It was nobody. Uh, love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind means that the Christian religion is a thinking religion. More, more of us have religion in our hands and feet than in our hearts and minds. When you come to church, don't leave your brains outside. The religion of Jesus Christ is a thoughtful religion. And we make a conscious decision to give our lives to Christ. Faith is not blind. Faith is as rational and reasonable as the science of mathematics. Because faith is based on empirical evidence. What God did before, he can do again. And if God did it before, God can do it again. And with all your strength, not just, not just in word only, but your faith, your belief, your empathy comes from your physical strength that you give to God in service and in worship. Brothers and sisters, the lawyer said, uh, uh, that's, that's it, I know it, I know what that is. Jesus said, well, that's enough right there for you to make it. Do that and you'll be all right. Just, just listen to what you just got through saying. But the lawyer of the scripture says, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, since I got to love God and love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? He thinks again that he has Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. And Jesus, however, has him right where he wants him. And it is there that Jesus tells a little story. He says, a man was headed down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him, beat him, and left him half dead. This man was ruined. He was on the ground beaten and left half dead. Ruined. And as, as luck would have it, a priest came by, saw the man, and went over to the other side. He saw this ruined man and went over on the other side. A Levite came by, saw this ruined man and went by on the other side. A priest who knows the rites of religion. He knows when all the feast days are held. He knows how to serve the Lord's Supper. He knows how to receive an offering for the temple. He knows all the rites of Christian, or of, of being an Orthodox Jew. And then the Levite knows not the rites, but he knows all the rules. The pastor, in other words, comes by, sees the man, and goes on the other side. The deacons and trustees and choir members and ushers and, and Sunday school teachers come by, see the man ruined, and reject him. They see him ruined and reject him. Because they are so busy going to church that they fail to be the church. And you can be so busy being churchy that you forget to do church. Oh, you look holy. You dress the part. You clap when everybody else claps. You stand when everybody else stands. But what are you on Monday? Who do you help on Friday? Do you go out of your way on Wednesday? 
Somebody ought to help me preach here. Because it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. They see this ruined man and they reject him. And then this Samaritan, this hated Samaritan, comes and sees the man and he can tell by the way he, he's dressed that he is a Jew. But it doesn't bother him that he's a Jew. He's a man in need. Climbs down from his beast, gets oil and wine. Oil to sanitize his wounds, wine to disinfect it. Pours it on the man, fixes him up as best he can. He puts him on his beast and he walks. Takes him not to Spring Hill Suites. But he takes him to the post oak. Brings him in and tells the people at the front desk, take care of him. I'm on business. And when I come back, if there's anything that I owe you, don't charge him. He doesn't have any money. Put it on my bill. And Jesus said, now who do you think is the neighbor? And, and the lawyer can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. He won't even let that come out of his mouth. He said, I guess the one who was a neighbor. Jesus said, now, nah, go and do likewise. The completeness of empathy is that when you see somebody in their ruined condition, don't reject them because God didn't reject you. But now, the cost of empathy, from character to completeness to cost, the cost of empathy is you've got to inconvenience yourself. You've got to put yourself out to help people in need who cannot return the favor. Because you ain't blessed if you're inviting me to your house to eat because I can invite you to my house to eat. The blessing comes when you see that homeless person. And if you don't invite them in, you at least make sure you meet their needs. Because before Jesus could heal, before Jesus could save, he served. These people who were famished, because they'd listened to Jesus teach all day long and they got to Jesus and Jesus asked the disciples, where can we buy some bread to feed all these people? And, and one of the disciples said, Lord, we just got a little bit of money in the treasury and a little bit we got is not enough to feed all these people even if we could. Jesus said, uh, you feed them. And they said, but we all, we, all we have is two fish and five loaves. He says, bring them to me. He lifts them up to heaven, gives it to the disciples, and multiplies by dividing and adds by subtracting because little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. But the cost of empathy is the man had to go out of his way, use his American Express, walk while he rides the man on his beast, and brings him and says, take care of everything he needs. And when I come back, if there's some overcharge, don't charge him, I'll take care of it. Can I allegorize and be finished here? One day you and I were ruined. We were on the side of the road, beaten and left half dead. And then some church folk passed by and saw us in our ruined condition. And said, get yourself together, then you can come join my Sunday school class. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and maybe you'll be able to make it. But then yonder comes a Galilean stranger 
a man by the name of Jesus who sees us in our ruined condition not only does he not reject us and not only does he go out of his way to help us but he becomes sin for us he dies in our place and becomes the substitute that God needs for our ransom if you didn't get that maybe you'll get this the problem is not the priest. The problem is not the Levite. And the Samaritan's work is not good. The scripture calls him a certain Samaritan, not a good Samaritan. What he did was good, but he was not good. What you and I may do is good, but we are not. There's only one good, and that one is God. But listen, the problem is not the priest or the Levite, or the Samaritan. The problem is they need to fix the road. Because if you fix the road, the man wouldn't get robbed. If you fix the road, the priest and the Levite wouldn't have to go by on the other side. If you fix the road, you get rid of the thieves and the robbers. How do you fix the road, Reverend? Put some lights on it. You are the light of the world. If you get on the road and be a light, the man won't get robbed. The thieves going to have to go hide. The drug dealers going to have to find them another corner because there are some lights on the road. 